Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are so delighted to have Yosef Yaffe come and, and give us a talk today. Um, Professor Yaffe is actually going to be teaching in residence uh, with us next semester, and we're all very excited about that. Uh, and he kindly agreed to come here beforehand to, you know, meet with students and uh, the check place out after after a few years. Um, he is professor of practice in international affairs, and he has a, a long history of relationship with Hopkins. Uh, he earned his MA from, from Johns Hopkins and uh, later taught nuclear strategy there in the mid 1980s. Uh, and he has a PhD in government from Harvard University. It's in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> his career has been divided between- typical. I mean. <laughs> I mean, Couldn't John's resist. Is number seven and Harvard is like number two. That's because they're all fixed. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, his, his career has been divided between journalism and academia uh, in Europe and in the United States. He, so he has a great deal, a great breadth of, uh, of experience. Um, he's held many prestigious teaching position, uh, positions, um, especially at SICE, of course, but um, also at Harvard and Stanford and at the University of Munich. Um, he's, he's served as the editorial page editor at Student, Student Deutsche thank you, in Munich, <laughs> and uh, editor of the weekly Die Zeit in Hamburg. I got that one though, right? So. You got that one, it's a short one. It's I know. <laughs> um, columns, essays, and books reviews. Uh, he's published in, in highly influential media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, uh, Financial Times, and all the, the top press. Uh, his scholarly contributions include pieces in foreign affairs, foreign policy, international security, and the American interests, uh, which he co-founded with uh, SAIS uh, colleagues, Elliot Cohen and Frank Fukuyama. So uh, he is a, uh, shall we say, the best type of uh, professor of the practice we can have at SAIS with a distinguished academic career, uh, as well as a distinguished career um, as a journalist. So, Yosef, thanks so much for coming to give us a talk today. And he's going to be talking about breaking the nuclear taboo after 77 years. Are Putin's threats credible, crazy, or just psy war? Over to you. Well, thank you. Put your button here? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been here many times and I want to preface this by saying the best part of coming here was the students who gave me a hard time with hard questions and made my not my blood boil but raised my adrenaline my blood pressure so that's the best reward you can have as a speaker get tough questions which I hope to get afterwards um, you know this is an interesting date today 60 <clears throat> 60 years ago Today was the end of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis when, you know, the Soviets had in place medium range missiles in, in, in Cuba. Uh, Kennedy threw up a blockade and for 13 terrible days, um, the world, you know, was expecting nuclear war, but it ended, it ended well and Khrushchev, Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev caved and his nukes went back home. But I want to start with an anecdote to kind of give you a sense of what it felt like in those days, um, which is kind of burned into my memory. So I was a student at Swarthmore then, you know, and we, there was a, <clears throat> there was a custom where the, your professors invited you for, for, for dinner. And mine was Ken Waltz, whom, Kenneth Waltz, whom I, I'm, I'm sure those of you who study international relations theory know well. Uh, he was one of the greatest in my in my book, and um, he explained why before the denouement, why it would turn out to be well, turn out well. Um, so everybody was hysterical, and at dinner he told the students, "Hey, keep cool, keep cool." Here's why: because you know the balance of power was in America's favor. Uh, first of all. The U.S. had local conventional superiority, you know, 90 miles away from the 
heartland and the Russians had almost nothing. The US had that point strategic um, superiority um, uh, compared, compared to the Russian arsenal. And um, um, the balance of legitimacy, that's my main point, we'll come back to it, was also in America's favor because uh, here was somebody who disturbed the status quo and very, very close up to the, to the American homeland. And in case like that, the defender has legitimacy on his side. And now, so you so tell us, don't worry about it, which, uh, which uh, worried, worried us, the students, a lot because if there was no nuclear war, we'd have to turn our papers on time. <laughs> no excuses, no extension. So in, after I've de delivered this cold-eyed uh, uh, realpolitik analysis, uh, he turned to his wife in the, back in the kitchen and said, Heidi, did you store enough water and canned food in the basement? What's the point of this story? The difference between how you think and how you feel between the heart and your mind. So even this great, great realist um, had, had, had second thoughts. So the difference between rational analysis and human emotion. Um, so Cuba is history. Um, but the lesson, I don't think, the lesson is not. What happened? Nuclear weapons have unhinged, you know, 500 years of statecraft since the rise of the nation state in Europe. They have unhinged um, that, that age when great power peace was just a pause between two wars. So um, we have lived, been privileged, uh, all of us here, by the, um, by the nuclear taboo, which has held for 77 years, ever since Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki perished in the nuclear fire. And ever since, Nuclear armed powers have never confronted each other directly. Uh, indirectly a lot, you know, everybody fought proxy wars, but never ever do you, do you uh, um, can go up against each other directly because of nuclear weapons. So today, yeah, as you all, you read almost daily in the papers, Putin keeps threatening tactical strikes on Ukraine. And so, the question is, is Putin crazy? After I've given you the logic of the nuclear age, is he crazy? As so many long distance psychiatrists have, have agreed, have diagnosed. And my, my answer is, if he is crazy, he's crazy like a fox. Um, why, why would I think so? Let's, let's, let's do a thought experiment, okay? Let's go back to the eve of World War I. August of 1914, right? Now assume the Tsar uh, or, or the other, all the other, um, the Tsars and the Kaiser and, and the and kings and prime ministers had a crystal ball where they could see what the world of 1918 would look like. Um, four empires had fallen. German, Austrian, Russian, Ottoman, gone. 20 million people had died, civilians and, and, and soldiers. Uh, it was followed by the rise of to totalitarianism, fascism, say, which ultimately seg segued into, into World War II. So at that, so the only guy who had it right in those days was was British Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Gray, and it's a very famous, famous quote, I'll repeat it anyway, quote, the lamps are going out all over Europe, we shall not see them lit again in our time, end of quote. So the, the, the cosmic difference between then and now is that we don't need that crystal ball, okay, to know what the future after nuclear war would be. Um, um, you know, from countless studies, we know, you know, that any nuclear exchange would end up, you know, with 
tens and tens of million um, of, of casualties. Um, and it might even lay waste to the planet because you know, the nuclear cloud doesn't respect regimes or borders. Now you might interject, um, wait a minute, Putin is after all threatening only tactical nuclear weapons, right? Little ones. Um, um, and the little bombs, you know, like tactical, will not threaten the apocalypse, okay? Um, so what exactly is a tactical nuclear weapon? Well, they <clears throat> go from a very low yield, like you know, half a kiloton to about 170 kilotons, tactical weapons. Now compare that to the Hiroshima bomb that killed 90,000 90, people. That only had a yield of 15 kilotons. So this idea that you know, tacticals are like little stuff that we can ignore is being belied by the technology of um, and yield of, of so-called tactical weapons. So then you could still ask, you know, couldn't Putin count on a tightly limited nuclear war, you know, short of Arm Armageddon? Um, think again. When we think back at 1945, only the United States had a handful of nukes and the Russians in 45 had none. Today, the two of them have around 12, 13,000 nuclear weapons, 2,000 of which on each side are tactics. Um, and as a result, and, and I always, let me give you a quote by James Mattis, who was for a while um, Trump's, Trump's uh, uh, Secretary of Defense. Quote, I don't think there's any such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. Any nuclear weapon used at any time is a strategic game changer. So much for the fire break. Uh, and he was echoed by Joe Biden almost, quote, I don't think there's any such thing as the ability to use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon. So let me go back to, even farther, let me go back to Clausewitz, yeah? the all-time great in, in our business and his classic on war. Quote, it is imperative not to take the first step without considering what may be the last. He said that even in a world without nuclear weapons. Um, and then you, and John F. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis probably cribbed from Clausewitz, and here is another great line, quote, it isn't the first step that concerns me, but both sides escalating to the fourth and fifth step. And we don't go to the sixth step because there won't be anybody around to take it. Um, so much, but, for the little, the nature of little tactical nuclear weapons. So my basic point is this, as Putin waves his club, he can't count on a fire break between tacticals and strategic. And why, why, why then does this screw around? His, his general staff surely has studied American war games. Take a Princeton study some year ago, which simulated that US um, uh, a Russian exchange. It begins with tacticals and ends with strategic weapons. And uh, that simulation uh, said that um, you end up with, with um, 90 million dead. Um, so the point is climb one rung and you quickly end up on the top of the ladder. But Putin is crazy, right? Um, look at it from his side. He can't just, he can talk, talk is cheap, but you can't just strike out, out of the blue. So what happens if you really become serious about starting a tactical war? Where will US intelligence will detect in real time all the telltale signs. 
you know, Russia would have to bring its tactical warheads out of storage, mount them on, on vehicles, these vehicles spread out, everything will be seen in, in real time. Um, um, Space-based surveillance would also notice increased activity among the special tactical forces and so forth. So even that might be a bluff, but here's the problem. The, the duel of wills won't stop you because Putin would have to take out strategic and a strategic insurance policy to maintain overall global deterrence. So long range weapons on mobile launchers uh, and missile submarines would go out on heightened alert. And finally, we would see the strategic command and control system start buzzing, we would notice. And we would have to think that this is going towards, towards the big war. Um, you can still surmise that this is for show only, okay? Uh, blackmail and psychological warfare to cow the West into, into submission. But look at it again from the Russian, from the Russian side, okay? Um, <clears throat> um, when they game the, the, the effects of this, they couldn't, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't ignore the obvious. What's the obvious? As the US watches these maneuvers, it could not know whether this was just a make-believe recklessness. And so to deter the real thing, the US would put its strategic forces on a heightened alert. At DEFCON 2 perhaps, maybe even DEFCON 1, which is appropriately called cocked pistol. Hmm? Um, and so would Britain and France and the Russians as well. Um, bombers would take to the air, missile silos would shed their protective covers. And ner nervousness and, and fear would beat overwhelm restraint. So what happens in a situation like that? Just a slight miscalculation or misunderstanding would set off a strategic exchange, a strategic exchange. If you make the moves, let alone drop a little device, Putin would have to countenance all out escalation and prepare accordingly. In general, in a nuclear world, Putin cannot count on limited war. That's my basic point. If you start or only pretend to start a limited war, you don't need a crystal ball to know what comes next. So you always, when you play around with little, web, little tacticals, you have to factor in the big one whose cost would dwarf whatever, whatever you may hope to gain in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, again, if you look, read the papers day by day, he's a case for the loony bin, right? Not quite. To make my point, let me invoke the madman theory of international politics you've heard of, or also the rationality of irrationality. Hmm? And this is a favorite, favorite uh, 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 example of mine, first, um, first um, enunciated by Tom Schelling, Thomas Schelling, one of the greats in the, in the strategic business. So he says here, look, imagine you're sitting on your porch and then somebody shows up, you know, well-dressed and he very softly says, give me 20 bucks or I will shoot my brain out right here and now. He says it very quietly, very good. You probably wouldn't believe him, right? You would say, hey, have a seat, have a, in those days, have a cigarette, not today. Today you would give him a you know, hot chocolate and let's talk <laughs> this over. Now the guy goes, goes off. 10 minutes later, the same guy comes back. Now his hair is deranged. His eyes are rolling. He's trembling all over and he's foam at the mouth. Wouldn't you give him the 20 bucks rather than, gee, if I don't, if he blows his brain out, I have to repaint the porch and the police will keep me in interrogation for you know, several hours. He gets the 20 bucks. Um, so you, you see how the rationality of irrationality works. This example is a perfect one. Unfortunately, it's not mine, it's Tom Schelling's. And so Putin may simulate insanity 
but it's rational brinkmanship. Uh, intimidate Ukraine and the West, and he will do a lot better than his failing army. Uh, note, by the way, this is important. When you read the paper, it sounds like he's threatening like to throw a nuke every, every day. If you, look at, if you look at what he actually said, he never says, never actually makes concrete here and now uh, 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 threats. Um, he, he, he kind of, and why, why, of course he wouldn't. He won't tie his hands. He won't want to get in a situation where he has to. Really. So it's always kind of diffuse if and uh, blah, blah. Um, So the really crazy stuff, which is also part of the rationality of irrationality game, he leaves to his underlings. So my favorite one is uh, his henchman, Duma member Andrei Gorulyev, who went bonkers on state TV. Quote, we shouldn't nuke Ukraine because we're going to have to live there, unquote. So whom should we nuke? Well, we should nuke London and Berlin, the centers of decision-making, he says, especially London. I don't know why. Um, uh, um, he, uh, he says, you know, we can reduce the islands into Martian wasteland in three minutes, okay? He blathered. Putin doesn't say that. His underlings do, and you, you can you can turn on CNN today, and you get quotes like that again. So, if this is madness, there's method in it. Famously, uh, Polonius famously said in, in Hamlet. So, make believe make believe lunacy, also known as psi war, promises to be a winner, just as it was for the man on Schelling's porch. Uh, pretend to lose control, and you frighten your target into submission. To pretend madness is the real game. To execute the threat is not credible in a world of 13,000 nuclear weapons. Now, if you look at the American side, I think that, uh, you know, here's a president, Joe Biden, who likes to go off script a lot, yet the president does understand the world we live in. So when you listen to him, um, he, um, what, what, is, what does the West do? Well, the US has dispatched some $50 billion in military and financial aid, and the pipeline remains open. The US delivers precious space-based and battlefield intelligence that enables the Ukrainians to score tactical surprises. You know, the US sends uh, high precision, high Mars, multiple rocket launchers, yet their range, and this is where the, where the you know, where the, the dialogue, quote unquote, uh, becomes quite poignant. Their range is around 90 kilometers. US has more interesting stuff called attackums that have a reach of, you know, 200 miles, 300 kilometers that could hit Russian territory. No, we're not going to get those. So, so we help, but we don't go. We don't go overboard. We might still send Abrams tanks and jets, but we don't. They we keep them like U.S. keeps them in in in, in reserve, just as a high po high power bargaining chip that should give Putin pause. Um, but the the message from the U.S. is whatever we do we will honor the nuclear taboo. Um, and so these are all defensive weapons so far um, that fall way, way short of boots on the ground, which the West avoids like the plague, because that's a real escalatory step. Um, then all bets will be off. And um, my point is that the West and instead of talking like Putin, clearly draws a red line for itself, for itself, self-deterrence, if you wish, uh, in this war. So at the end of my talk, am I still on the limit? You're still within limit. Can I talk a lot more? No. Oh. <laughs>
<laughs> At the end of my talk, let me go back to Ken Waltz. I started with Kenneth Waltz, you know, the father of neorealism. Um, to Ken Waltz 60 years ago, when he argued that the balance of legitimacy was on the American side. So the, then, you know, the US were the aggressors, the, uh, sorry, the USSR was the aggressor, the US the defender. And Khrushchev's deadly game was to overturn the status quo or Kennedy's to uphold it against blackmail. So I think today the West again has legitimacy on its side because in Ukraine, it's to try to protect and promote two precious values. One is moral. We have, there's, we're trying to save an innocent nation uh, beset by Russian imperialism. And this in the heart of Europe. And the other value is embodied in a singular historical feat. A European order no longer based on conquest. This is big time, never happened before. Um, it is the longest great power piece in the history of this blood drenched continent. And it's a gift treasured also by you know, the wobbly members of the Alliance you know, the French and the French and the Germans who are always trying to act as a, or attempt to act as a broker between East and West. Why do I keep harping on legitimacy throughout this talk? If you are on the, on the better side of history, it helps you to retain stamina, will, and credibility in spite of, you know, and skyrocketing energy prices and skyrocketing inflation. Even in the most detente minded, even the most detente minded Europeans would not want Russian armies ensconced on the Polish Ukrainian border once they could dominate the Baltics. And that's rational. I think it's rational. This is not off the wall. Um, um, and it, what, what I'd like to stress is something very rare also in the history of statecraft. This here, you know, moral politic and real politic uh, go hand in glove. Or put differently, Ukraine is fighting not only for itself, but also for us, Europe. So. There is an obvious counter to what I'm saying. Doesn't the West need to give Putin an off ramp? You've heard that argument before, you know, that allows them to save face. So I'm, recent history has made me doubtful about this. Uh, uh, it's not reassuring. Think about, you know, the last back 10 years or so. The West had talked had talk Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons by extending security guarantees in the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. Ukraine was a real repository of strategic and tactical weapon, weaponry. Alas, that didn't prevent massive Russian rearmament, nor did the West come to the help of Ukraine when Putin grabbed Crimea and the Southeast. Nor did the Minsk agreement, always Minsk, Budapest, always these um, exotic capitals, the Minsk agreement of 2015, nor did that work. It was to remove heavy weapons from the theater and restore Kiev's control over its borders. And you know how that story ended on February 24, um, declared, no, February 22, two days before the 24th, Putin declared the deal null and void, and two days later, he pounced. So such is the oldest law of international politics, I would argue. Opportunity makes for a thief. You don't have to assume evil, evil mindedness. It's just opportunity. Putin acted, I think, perfectly rationally when he went on his expansion is a rampage. So we'll, you know, go while, while the going is good. I'm afraid that seeding the Southeast, which is part of you know, what's in discussion now, seeding uh, the Southeast will not still but wet his appetite because Putin has clearly signaled that he wants to restore at least de facto uh, the old Russian, Russian empire. Uh, uh, and to gain, at least to gain a <coughs> certified sphere of influence 
in Europe what the French call a droit de regard. If the West gives, I'm afraid Putin will ask for more, which is a bitter lesson of great power politics. So my argument is deterrence and balance of power is better than psychotherapy or propitiation. But to repeat, no direct intervention because that is a no-no uh, against the rules of the nuclear age. So be before we open the floor, we, this is the moment you've been waiting for, let me repeat my basic point. Putin is playing the madman. Crazy though, is not the same as stupid. Um, you know who, who are the greatest strategists of all time? Little kids. Uh, if you, I mean, picture a little, you know, three-year-old and a mom in a supermarket. And he wants uh, her to buy, uh, well, the answer would be M&M's here, Smarties. Buy me the Smarties. And mom says no. So he starts screaming, I'm going to overturn the shelf. It is probably most likely that um, mom will will relent, but actually she shouldn't have been blackmailed. But now you want to avoid the embarrassment. Uh, the point is little kids, watch little kids if you want to learn strategy. Don't think waltz or shelling, watch three-year-olds. Um, I can tell you lots of examples which have entered the theoretical canon. Um, so the point is Putin pretends insanity, but he need not. So Paul said to peer into the future, a nuclearized world, those who shoot, to put it very simple mindedly, those who shoot first die next. And thank you for listening and not leaving, uh, which I regard as a compliment. And now it's time for you to shoot holes into my argument, but no real guns, just metaphorically speaking. Thank you and shoot away. Thanks so much, Joseph. A very interesting evaluation of the situation. If I might mention from my own personal experience that the Italian mother would not relent. She wouldn't? So, no way. <laughs> anyway, we have... Well, I wouldn't either. <laughs> Well, we have we have some time for uh, some Q and A, um, and the we have uh, at least fifteen participants online. So, if you have any questions, uh, those of you in Zoom land, uh, please uh, put your questions in the Q and A uh, box. And um, as we wait for those, why don't we open up for any questions you may have? As as our tradition, we give preference to students, of course. Why do you think Italian mothers wouldn't really? Well, because my mother certainly would, and I, uh, I've got, I've got the marks to prove it. <laughs> but you don't have to tell your mother. I do. Oh, okay. Do. <laughs> don't let the plumber fool you. <laughs> Plumerino. Yeah. Right. How are you doing, Professor? Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Omar, and we spoke briefly by email. Yeah, you never called back. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sit down. I wanted to ask you about the one of the last things that you were talking about, which is the, the Minsk agreement. Because in, in my eyes, like I see Putin in, in like the Peter Great Memorial talking about how he wants to be seen in a similar light and all this. But I see it as just a way for him to justify it to himself for what he did, mm -hmm. rather than him having done the expansion out of an expansionary Not instinct. Sure. And I so I, I always thought about he, he's been shouting about the Minsk agreements since they've been signed. So the Minsk agreements had the, a, a better chance of being implemented. Do you think that the war would have happened the way it happened? You mean if we all had guaranteed uh, Ukraine's borders? Yes. But with autonomy to the this, Donbass, which is... Like, yeah, uh, yeah. This, I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into the autonomy of the Donbass because it's a very, very complicated... I don't know enough. But I mean, how would we have guaranteed those borders? Yeah. Huh. Would we have put Western troops on the, in the Donbass? That would have been a very provocatory move, right? Yes. And I think I would even partially then agree with 
with Putin, hey, that was not part of the deal. You, you don't come in here. You don't come up against our border. And that's why it didn't happen. So I think the Minsk agreement was a sham to begin with. Okay. Okay. It was a face-saving gesture. I think. Okay. I certainly would not have sent NATO troops to to the Donbass. Yes. No. Not, not in a situation like that. But, but I'm like, just a reasonable guy. <laughs> but, but this is just a, a little question. But uh, Professor, why do we consider the fact that the U.S. and North Korea regularly exchange nuclear threats not a break of the taboo? Well, the break of the taboo would be to execute. Okay. Um, they have. Um, it, so that's a very good question, but I think I can't really see any real good triggers for war. What what would either side gain by that? Would it would it uh, unify the Korean Peninsula? Uh, we've respected that border since 1953. So that's my somewhat lame answer. I think it's a different game between the two of them. I have to think about it. Oh, next next year. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's a good point. Okay, please. Uh, how about Professor Cordella? <laughs> okay. Um, hi, thank you so much hi. for coming. My question is, how would you navigate the security dilemma in a situation like this? Like, how do you avoid ramping up defenses, uh, but not to come off as offensive towards Russia? Well, I think it, it's, it's kind of implicit in my argument. Um, you want to make sure as much as you can to stay the side of the escalatory ladder. And I think that there's certainly, as I, as I argued here, this is what the West has been doing. But, you know, I, to prepare, I prepared this lecture, I, I really went on the Russian record because reading the newspapers, I thought, hey, the guy's about to throw a nuke tomorrow. And I looked at, at Putin's rhetorical record, no such thing. You see, one of the rules is you don't want to, force your own hand. You always want to have wiggle room. And this is why he has been ex actually very careful not to threaten directly. And as that's why I quoted you this bad guy, this general, who said, yeah, let's, let's not nuke Ukraine. We're going to have to live there. We're going to nuke Berlin and London. Um, but that's also quite transparent, I think. Um, I think we are, what I'm trying to say is we are aware of the security dilemma. And, it's, and we are staying on this side of where it goes off into uncontrolled escalation. It's the best answer I can give you. I, uh, if I were a prophet, I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be making tons of money in the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us back to your expression, uh, opportunity creates a thief. In the stock markets, I was thinking of the global financial crisis. <laughs> yeah, but it's been going up again. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I'm curious to hear what you think um, about the likelihood of nuclear war by accident or miscalculation, which I kind of see as the more likely scenario than an intentional use by Russia or North Korea. As long as like the US has ICBMs on hair trigger alert, aren't we more vulnerable to getting into an accidental war caused no. by maybe a false alarm? And what, what do you think about that? Because I just see that I, as more I, likely. I agree with you. That you, once you go into DEFCON 3 or certainly into DEFCON 4, cock, called cock pistol, then all, all my wonderful rational bets are off. But the point I was trying to make is that both sides are actually quite, quite cautious in not crossing certain lines. Even Mr. Crazy Man is, as I said. And uh, my next point would be, not would be, is, I mean, and I, we are in constant dialogue. We, I mean, the U.S. nuclear nuclear authorities and the Russians are in constant conversation with each other, and we have tons of device. I'm sure. I'm sure I can't guarantee there are back channels galore, as by the way, 
there were 60 years ago in um, in the Soviet American um, um, confrontation. So th that's it. May not be a very <clears throat> compelling answer, but I think that's how I would analyze the situation. Why I don't think we are at you know even DEFCON three. Um, but you're right. Once you are kind of hair trigger thing, then all these my nice rational bets are off, and that's why we avoid <laughs> hair trigger. Uh, Tito, do you want to? <clears> Hi, <throat> very interesting presentation. I just have a question. You said that Putin is pretending uh, uh, to play the mad yeah. the madman. Yeah. So, in game theoretical terms, this is an out of equilibrium threat. So, why it is optimal for the West to react to an out of equilibrium threat by restricting the strategy space, by committing not to uh, not going all the way out? What is the equilibrium of the game? Well, we are not committing. We are, that's, that's part of the problem. Committing is ties your hands, right? We are making all these signaling moves that say, look, we're gonna resist you, or we are not going to start a real war. That's my simple answer, but I'm sure you're not happy with that answer. So go yeah, ahead. I mean, an optimum saddle point in the game or something yeah, like that? The strategy is a well, okay, now I'm going to be, be unfair to you. You tell me what would be up to. No, 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 no. no please. <laughs> you expect me to know you're so, the specialist? I'm supposed to. No, I'm asking the answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, uh, uh, yeah, I cannot, I don't want to repeat myself. I think we had, we had signaling resolve without signaling that things will get out of hand. What else can I say? I'm sure you have a better answer than I do. Well, I don't ask the question if you don't have it better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I expected a better answer. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my uh, my uh, question was that uh, I feel that the uh, military reverses uh, for Russia uh, in uh, in Ukraine will will continue to uh, drive it more more and more towards uh, escalation. So first we saw the mobilization and now we see the uh, threat of ta tactical nuclear weapons. So my question to you was, uh, uh, in this slide, would you, uh, what do you think of a strategy of negotiating and making certain concessions like, you, like, uh, like a Ukraine neutrality to Russia uh, or whether that would be a foolish, uh, a foolish mis mistake like the uh, Munich uh, agreement? Um, you know, Obviously, while we confront each other, negotiations go on, sub Rosa, quietly, so on. I have no problem with guaranteeing neutrality because we already done that in a way. We have not acceded to Ukraine's wish to join NATO. Well, we are now talking about the EU. Listen, if I could get Putin out of the country by guaranteeing neutrality, I'll do it. But I think the, the, the stakes are a bit higher here when we, in, the, in our kind of public discussion, we're thinking about seeding the Southeast. That I think would be more like a 1938 game. You just give a chunk and then you whet somebody's appetite. It would whet my appetite if I were Putin. So <clears throat> I would make, I would look very carefully at this thing at the distinctions. Neutrality would affirm what the status quo already is. I mean, nobody talks about letting, maybe Zelensky wants to go into that. We won't. Um, but, you know, we hope we're, we're, we're showing half of our hand by, because we might deliver jets. We might deliver long range air defense. And so on. And that's part of the bargaining process. The problem is you have to be willing to escalate, but stop at the right moment. 
I'm glad I'm not the president. No, I'm glad I'm glad not to be Putin. <laughs> I'm just an academic. Um, hello, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I can totally understand your argument why under the current situation, uh, it is rather unlikely that uh, he strikes nuclear bombs. But where do you think um, if this national Out, uh, uh, if situation we're all a certain kind of logic would 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 say yes that they, they'll, they'll but my logic that I'll outline laid out here says so you don't even launch a single tactical nuclear weapon uh, because of that long tail of consequences. Um, I mean, obviously, a real, real red line is the Russian-Ukrainian border. Um, but we'll have to talk again six months from now. I would still argue tactical nuclear weapons for a small state. We're not talking about Russian survival, regime survival. Uh, the, the country with its 10 or 11 time zones, we're talking about a small sliver of a neighboring country. Do you really, does it make sense to threaten nuclear war because of the slice there when the existential issues are not at stake? I'm asking the question, I'm not giving you the answer. But it doesn't make sense. I think nuclear weapons, I would like to make a basic point, are credible only when your nation, national survival is at stake then all bets are off, and then it makes sense. It's, it's in a way like the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years ago. You know, those, those medium range missiles could have covered the entire American Eastern Seaboard. So it was an existential issue. Uh, but for Putin, well, maybe he's crazy, who knows? I don't think he's crazy. I mean, he's got a great, Listen, crazy guys do not get inducted into the KGB, as he was. He was a head of KGB in Dresden in Germany. These guys were tested. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I'm wondering what you think the West's reaction should have been over here. <laughs> uh, should have been when Putin took Crimea. I'm wondering what you think the West's reaction should have been when Putin took Crimea. Well, we did, you know, we, we, we imposed sanctions. It was a quick operation. It was underhanded. You know, those famous little green men. And in a weird way, Putin could claim all kinds of legitimizing arguments. You know, this used to be uh, Ukraine until uh, sorry, this used to be the Soviet Union until Khrushchev gave it away and he could go back. And then we we had the Ukraine since 1783. But remember, Catherine the Great, Catherine the Great of Germany and Russia, she grabbed the Crimea from the Krim, from the Tartars, from the Krim Tartars. So it was also a kind of booty. Uh, it was stolen property. Nonetheless, I think uh, the swiftness of of the occupation and the lack of domestic um, resistance, like like the whole nation is now in arms, and um, made it a kind of fait accompli, which was hard to repress. That's my my answer. And there was yeah, semi legitimate. I don't want to call it legitimate, but it used to be. Core, country, core part of the Soviet Union. Hello, uh, thank you so much for your talk. And um, to draw another parallel to the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, there were many, if we want to define them as tactical nuclear weapons, deployed both in the southern you know, in parts of Florida as well as in Cuba during that process. And there were in fact many factions, both within the United States military and within the um, Cuban military, Castro specifically, who were very willing to and, and wanted to actually do 
a preemptive strike. Um, yeah, sure. Right. And so specifically like Maxwell Taylor, the, the chief joint chief, uh, his, his argument was that they're not inherently wrong. There's nothing specifically different about use of tactical nukes, but the, the problem is to, um, to make them sufficiently small and flexible um, to permit a separate stage and escalation short of use of weapons. Is that what of Maxwell Taylor said? What's that? Maxwell Taylor. Maxwell said Taylor said that. Yeah. And so my, my question for you is maybe we can assume that Putin isn't mad that he's using this, this madman theory, but what's to stop certain aspects of his um, military establishment when they're in a, when they're feeling oh, mean, cornered from. You mean rogue, rogue elements? Yeah. Rogue elements because um, it's that's hard a, to. That's a very, very important technical question. Everything I know about failsafe mechanisms on either side are designed to prevent precisely that. I admit that we've all seen the movies, you know, where some loony submarine commander, or I mean, not only that, go back to the most famous one uh, of 1964, the Dr. Strangelove. Has anybody here seen Dr. Strangelove? It, it, uh, it, it killed a budding relationship with the girl I'd been pursuing in college for weeks, and she finally agreed to go to the movies with me. And then after we saw the movie, we just were so depressed. <laughs> <laughs> that aside, but you know, that's a, that's a classic, right? I mean, the, the guy decides, yeah, I'm gonna save Western Civ and then certain things intervene, which cut him off from communications. I mean, a, a missile explodes nearby the, is B-52. And so they're out of reach and there's no way for the failsafe mechanisms to to, uh, to to kick in. All I can tell you is that because we don't need that crystal ball that I've been mentioning, there's, there's a, a very impressive array of um, failsafe stuff. And I don't, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna tell you, I don't, I can't, can't get it. The, everything I know about the mechanism is that the rogue element in this or that, contrary to the movies which we keep seeing, can't launch nuclear war, tactically. Um, I don't want to bore you with the, with the, with the mechanism, but um, unfortunately, I have to return to the issue. I've seen half a dozen movies, you know, where in the movies they circumvented the mechanism. I don't think so. It's... I mean, nuclear war is, is something unimaginable. Let me put it this way. Let me give you an example. In the old days, pre-nuclear, we could make miscalculate, right? The, the Germans and the Russians miscalculate on the eve of 1914 and you know, the Russians started general mobilization and then the Germans had to preempt, blah, blah. Uh, in, in world, uh, prior to World War II, Hitler literally wanted that war and he was really pissed at his people when they presented him with the famous, infamous Munich agreement. <clears throat> um, the difference in those days, and of course, you know, these, they all miscalculated, correct? I mean, big time, big time, uh, you know, 100 million dead in two wars or so. Um, I, in a conventional setting, you can be defeated, you can be completely defeated, like Germany and Japan were, but you can come back. Your nation is going to remain alive. Today, you can't afford even the slightest mistake because the whole goddamn, the whole nation is at stake. That's, I think, the difference between a pre and a post nuclear world. Miscalculation did not have existential consequences in 1914 and in 1939 in 1871 when Bismarck attacked the, the French and all those European wars you know Richelieu and etc etc and Napoleon Napoleon got really really wiped out right and an army of 600,000 did France get wiped out no at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 you know, France was at the table and they got to dance with all the ladies in Vienna at, at night. Oh, that's a great moment in diplomatic history. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. Svetchenko. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, yeah. uh, yes. Yes. But, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I was, I was Hero? Is he your hero? And you don't have to go and talk and we agree. I tried to add this in the first chapter of my PhD dissertation, but we both my PhD supervisor was a historian who told me to be cutting that. Oh no. What? Anyway, but uh, uh, on this question of the balance of legitimate fast. I think the balance of legitimacy in the United States partly because Try to sneak control Yeah, we uh, This always could have just agreed at a treaty with Cuba and and myth there. The show was not So that I think is how well. I think you're quite right. It turned out that he secretly tried to smuggle these missiles into the island. Of you know, quite clear uh, that the balance of the uh, 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 different balance of situation in Not all of Western Europe. He seems to reject him. Into the same thing. He will be. I agree. And also, the states are much higher for Russia in Ukraine compared to the United States. So, all of that is merely to say that Putin understands, he may well understand that the stakes are very high. He may calculate that when Putin comes to the middle, if you wear to you, you wear a the United States would actually be deterred from doing anything because it has no credibility because then, of course, it opens up the self for retaliation by, by the Russians. And that's the that escalation. You just invited me to give another one hour lecture. <laughs> uh, we don't quite. Uh... <laughs> Let me. Let me be on, first of all, withdrawn on the safe ground on the Euro missiles. They had stuff that could use, reach Madrid, and yes. we had stuff that couldn't reach the Soviet Union, the Pershing 1A. <clears throat> but the game that the Europeans actually played, without saying so, is if we have missiles, American missiles, emplaced in, in West Germany and Britain and Holland, so, that can reach the Soviet Union, they are, they are strategic weapons. And if you were a Russian planner, you would have to attack part of the, the American strategic arsenal in Europe. And that's what made in my book, this is why we talked about coupling. All the smart Europeans said, well, the smart Europeans like you, smarter perhaps said, hey, we're going to rope the Americans in. We are going to couple US European forces and the strategic arsenal so that the Russians would have to attack part of the strategic arsenal. Um, and I think it worked. It worked certainly in the way that uh, we deployed in 83 and by 86, 
seven, I think. Both sides agreed to, to get rid of this stuff. We were, we were lucky, we were good, we were smart. When you talk about whose stakes are bigger, I, I, would, I could turn it around. I mean, for the United States, the balance in Europe is part of its vital national interest and has demonstrated this, if you wish, since 1917, certainly since 1949 when NATO was founded. So it's part of, it's a big ticket item. Whereas I could, I could argue sliver of Ukraine, you start nuclear war. And then you said your last point was, yes, but you know, you can still do a little one and then there's hundred. My argument here was, there is no fire break. Now we can, we can run through the arguments again, but I would just like to repeat and reassert it. Uh, when you get into that kind of situation, all bets are off and then you have to countenance and I showed you some of the mechanisms. Why those hundred, why we, as what Kennedy said, you know, the sixth step where nobody would be around uh, would be taken. But you know, I, let me make a very basic point. When we talk about these issues here, we thought, talk in a way about nuclear theology <coughs> because we are talking about things which we haven't seen and experienced yet. But I don't want to see them. I don't want to experience them. So we're going to stay in the realm of um, nuclear theology. Okay. Don't you trust in God? <laughs> don't you trust in God? No, as I said, um, if I were a prophet, I would be sitting here. I would be at the Milano Bors <laughs> as a speculator. Um, that's, a, that's our problem, you know, in, in our field. We, the most interesting questions require prediction, which we cannot make in good conscience. That's why we like to study the, what? At least about the future. Well, you know, it's like Yogi Berra. Do you remember Yogi Berra? Famous for his, he was a famous American baseball player, famous for his, um, for his malapropism. And he said, somebody asked me a question like this. He said, I never ever make predictions and least of all about the future. So I stick with Yogi Berra. That's my, my withdrawal space. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, hey, going hey, to the, Going back to the point about neutrality, given that Ukraine applied for a fast track NATO membership back at the end of September, I mean, I know we're not really expecting NATO to move forward on that, but do you think Ukraine would ever really accept neutrality as a term to ending the war? Um, if not, what do you think would be kind of the, the bare minimum, realistically, the terms that Ukraine would accept well, to end the war? I know that you know depends on how it evolves as well, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I, I, as much as I'm, I'm in favor of Ukraine, I don't think NATO membership is Ukrainian choice. And, you know, we, we bandied around these terms, you know, in the early 2000s. <clears throat> we no longer talk about that. Um, so, as to your question, <clears throat> it depends how we structure the deal. Okay, listen, President Zelensky. No, no NATO membership. We have 28 members and somebody's going to veto it no matter what. But we will allow you to self-defend. We may let you into the EU. And if, you, if anybody here has followed the history of letting Turkey into the EU, I think we've been talking to them for, what, 60 years maybe? <laughs> Hmm? At least. So it's a long, 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 long thing. Um, we could uh, all give the Russians all kinds of guarantees, you know, no, uh, no long range weapons that can hit Moscow. The, the, the deal could be structured. 
depending on who is at point T sub one uh, winning or not. Right now, if I were the, if I'm the, um, if I'm the Ukrainians, I would not want even even armistice negotiate because I'm on a roll. An armistice would allow Putin to replenish and beef up his forces. Um, uh, so the the real issue again, which I don't know, no nobody does. How long is this war going to last? It could be a long war, but um, you can get me when I come back here in the in the spring. You can get me if there was a nuclear war. You can you can bash me. <laughs> You can make fun of me. You can ridicule me. Okay. <laughs> other other questions. I think, um, I think they want lunch. Mr. Yeah. Uh, Krina. Yeah. Thank you very much for an uh, interesting talk. Uh, I, I fully agree. And uh oh, that, that sounds bad. <laughs> Yeah, we had difference in earlier times, but that's 40 years ago. <laughs> no, but uh, my question is, uh, as we are both from Germany, and Mr. Putin knows Germany quite well, as you mentioned, because yeah. he lived in Dresden and speaks fluent German. So what is the calculus for him okay. to go on playing the insane one? Yeah. Keeping the nuclear fear up. If I look, yes, uh, you indicated the, the, I all think the war may be long. We don't know. He has two problems right now. The front in Ukraine is not good for him. And he really has a problem with the Western alliance and Europe sticking together for the time being. Now, I wonder, wonder you know that Germany, maybe Italy are some kind of weak links in the alliance. Yeah, psychological, so France, by the way. Psychological. And France, yes, of course. Now he might think not unrealistic. Here. Let's see what happens in winter time. Many Ukrainian refugees coming into Germany. There is already some kind of resistance building up. There, the Germany has maybe a problem, with energy, whatever. And then the next spring, things are really looking difficult. So, and then he comes up continuously with the nuclear threat. There is quite a sizable part, not dominant yet in Germany which and it's not least in the ruling Social Democratic Party, as we both know, who somehow feels we should accommodate with right. Russia. What is your outlook you, there, you know, beyond you know, the nuclear threat? I know, I, I have a perfect count to this. My expectations about the Germans and the French, especially the Germans, because they're in the middle and they have this tradition of Ostpolitik and all that, were, were very, very pessimistic. And what struck me was I was, I would have predicted exactly what you just said. So the Germans are going to yield. They're going to start negotiating. I was really amazed that I, to see that I was wrong. I, I, well, I, I was wrong on a lot of counts in the Ukrainian war, four of them. This is one of them. I didn't think the Russians would attack. I didn't think the Ukrainians would fight back, blah, blah. And I didn't think that the alliance was up would hold. And the really amazing <laughs> thing is how, with the logic of Ostpolitik, which is inbred into German foreign policy, was at least partially unhinged. And so in the beginning, they only gave 5,000 helmets. Uh, now it's more sophisticated stuff. And the rhetoric on the part of the government is pretty tough. So here, I admit it, I was totally wrong on the Germans. Not so wrong on the French, because I knew the French would have always been playing this game, the mediate between East and West and pocket the broker's fee. <laughs> and yeah, and that's what Macron, Macron's practically talking to Vladimir every other day on the phone. Uh, and they're being very reticent about delivering arms. Uh, so. I was wrong, and I'm happy that I was wrong. 
now your question is what about the wind inside? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I went wrong again. Look at this heavy jacket I'm wearing. <laughs> hey, man, hey, this is the end of October. <laughs> so the um, storage sites in, 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 in Germany are almost full. Uh, people have become conscious of having to save energy. You know, you know how good it felt in the hotel today? I could really open the shower and get warm water, which I never do at home. Um, because it's, so it's been priced in as it were, you know. The, so um, I can, again, we have to never make predictions, but I'm amazed by the opposite of what you're suggesting. I was, I thought just like you, just like you, I said, they are the most being in the middle, you know, kind of playing, playing this kind of um, back and forth game. I was, the interesting thing I'm gonna stop here is the left-right coalition that we see in the entire West. So uh, in Germany, it's the left party and the right, right-wing outlier called the alternative for Germany, right? This, one. this is a famous horseshoe theory of politics. Dixie. But in the United States too, it's, it's the right which used to be gung-ho and it isn't. Um, why, why is this the case? I, I give up. Do you have an answer? Why, why do inimical ideological forces gang up together? Do you have an answer? Anybody? What is interesting, this, what, what? Uh, I'm a former social democratic party, so uh, uh, we were all of us I were. Party movement. Bingo, bingo, bingo. 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 Yeah. I tell you, maybe when I talked about legitimacy and all that kind of stuff and balances, I think people understand that there's something big happened in the Ukraine. But the Greens, the Greens who came to power as a party of pacifism and fought against the Euro missiles, they, they are now the, mo the most warlike party in the world. Why? Well, you know, you can always make all kinds of arguments, generational change and blah, blah. Um, we are not talking about the grizzled greens of, you know, we're now in the 70s, the ones that we knew when we were young. But it's the 40-year-olds, you know, Anna Lena Baerbock, who is what, 41 or something? So being a, touting myself as a realist, I say, well, thinking follows uh, real stuff. And so the threats are modulating or changing the thinking. Doesn't sound great, um, but it's the only explanation I have. Do you have, an, do you have a better, I mean, you have the same thing, you know, all of us here, in all of our countries, I think there's an interesting reversal and remingling of, of political forces. Anybody who's, who's, um, who's an Italian here? Are there Italians here in this? Not sure. Who? Well, um, how do you explain what's happening in Italy? Okay, okay. We've okay. only got 10 minutes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm not a student, I'm visiting. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <clears throat> sorry for my voice. Um, actually, it's kind of hard to explain. I was just listening and visiting around okay. and I'm, I'm a bit nervous, so. <laughs> okay. That was an elegant cop out. <laughs> any, any other questions? Anybody knows why the right and the left in Western countries are joining hands, joining forces to uh, against the war? Omar, Omar, you want to do it? Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, but it's not even just about the war. Um, yeah. Like, for example, say in, in France with the new parliament, both left and right ganged up together to actually kill the government's anti-COVID bill. Okay, but that's a different issue. 
Yes. So, so the thing with me is that I've been seeing that politics is becoming more about people who feel like they represent the will of the populace and people who are fighting for establishment figures and establishment positions and establishment opinions. And so that's where I see, I see the left and right, the, fringe, the left and right, both seeing themselves as populists okay. and uh, representing the will of the majority, the silent majority rather mm -hmm. than, mm -hmm. that's my, my explanation. I don't know if it, how- So how because the government is, takes position A on the Ukrainian war, you're bound to take position against A, right? Kind of. That's the point. That, that's what I feel. Um, it's anti-establishmentarian politics. It's the same thing with Trump. But now Republicans are threatening to withhold aid to Ukraine if they win. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, that's what I, that's what I was responding to. Yeah, and public. And this is what Putin is hoping to exploit, by the way, in Europe. This is what he's counting for, i.e. inflation, energy costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, Europeans are paying for this war. The United States is not paying for this war. The United States mm, providing weapons. 50 billion. The United States is providing weapons. It's providing weapons, but the costs, economic costs, are mainly borne by European societies. In immigration, of course, immig not immigration, sorry, the um, refugees, refugees, you know, all of that is imposing very high costs. And, and so that, I think, is driving the populist narrative. So well, there is a question about how long this can be sustained because there is a fatigue, uh, awareness, and, and we can see that. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Every, every, but every time, of course, Putin, Putin's army allows atrocity or, or genocide in Ukraine, of course, this brings back together. So it's, it's not a... Have you, have you considered the following, which again surprised me? I was, you know, in the beginning, of course, CNN and BBC, you know, the international global networks obviously covered the war big time. But you know, I thought this would subside. They're still doing it every night. And I think um, what we see there, which are atrocities, do kind of burn, the, burn themselves into the soul of Western uh, 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 viewers. The, this is again something a surprise for me how, what is it now, the seven or seven months of war? Uh, coverage has almost not, subsi has not subsided. It has subsided. Some, but, but, but yeah. But it, it's, it's still an hour kind of in front of us if we wanted to, unless we wanted to switch to a US series or something. Um, as far as costs are concerned, this is one of those typical social science issues which we can't resolve. Both, both the US and the Europeans are suffering from big time inflation, right? I don't, do you think we, we, we ascribe inflation to Ukraine? I, I think we don't, but the problem is. I think European, European inflation is more a strike of inflation than US. So we have the same numbers. No, but the core versus headline. Okay, we have core inflation is less. The main driver of inflation is energy and food prices. Yeah. In the US, it is a much lower share of the recent Well, it's also, it's also demolishing the housing market in the United States. I mean, raising, rising interest rate. I, again, this is, we're living in an interest, in an interesting times because a lot of our certainties don't, you know, are not rooted in concrete. Um, so far, we seem to be adopting, adapting to, to the phenomena we're talking about. At least we don't seem to be ascribing this to our resi to Western resistance, I don't know. Um, and I don't think it has anything to do with it, unless we talk about our sanctions, which, diminish our own supply of gas and oil. We've also learned that the Russians are ruthless in terms of using energy as a weapon. I mean, the Germans who started 1970, 
under the Willy Brandt government, 1970, with their first gas deal with the Russians. It's been a holy cow. It's been, you know, um, the Trinity or whatever. And um, will we look for liquefied LNG terminals in Germany? Never. I mean, Chancellor Merkel was against it. And now people are realizing, hey, this was like a real grievous strategic mistake we made by being so unilaterally dependent on energy for the, for, to the Russians. So, you know, it always depends on how you look at this thing. I, I, I was surprised and I see how, what has really changed in at least in the key player that is Germany in this game is, is amazing. Who the hell knows? Maybe two months from now we'll start fracking. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we, I mean, in Germany, in Lower Saxony, there's enough gas in the ground to keep Germany going for 20 years. All right. But you see, we are in a business. We call ourselves political scientists, but we keep our raw material as the irrationality of how people act. Would you, I mean, would you close down, a normal person, would they close down nuclear power plants in Germany? What about the French who have closed down half of their 50 something power plants for repair? What a crazy move to have half of your, um, half of your potential in the, in, the, in, the, in the shop, so to speak. That's why we are not a science. Political science is not a science. But you're an economist, right? Yes. You're better off. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, when I, whenever I read the political science literature, I always think of that philosopher Yogi Berra when he said about policy advice that yeah, uh, when you when you come to a fork in the road, take it. You take it. <laughs> anyway, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, uh, Joseph, Joseph, for such a, a wonderful talk. And I think the fact that you stimulated such an active uh, set of questions was uh, indicative of how, how interesting it was. And we're all looking forward to your starting to teach with us uh, in a few months. God willing. Putin willing. Maybe there's an the trains won't run anymore and the planes won't fly anymore. Then you have to do without me. Um, but or I have to rent a horse. I could rent a horse. Anyway, thank you. I, you know, all speakers secretly watch how many people leave the room while they're talking. And I only saw two. And that is the biggest compliment this group could have given me. Just two people peeling off. Thank you. I'm impressed with myself. And that's 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 a lesson to students to never leave during a talk because you'll be out, you'll be witness. And thanks everybody online. It was great, it was fun. Pressing the button.